Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive it written in our heart, written in our mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. Thank you for all that you bring forth this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing messages on the subject of the fall feast fulfillment, the prophetic fulfillment of the feasts of the Lord. The feasts of the Lord are important for you to understand. As the feasts of the Lord, we go back to Leviticus chapter 23, they're not Jewish feasts. They're not Old Testament feasts. They're God's feasts. Leviticus 23, 2. Speak unto the children of Israel, say unto them concerning the feasts of the Lord, which you should proclaim to be holy convocations. Even these are my feasts. They're God's feasts. And what are these feasts all about? They're all about the work of Jesus Christ to bring forth the work in mankind to accomplish his purpose, which is to bring forth redemption, to bring forth reconciliation and restoration in all things, and to bring forth the total work of redemption in our life, including the glorified body, bring us into the place of seeing of the full, final fulfillments of all these. The most fulfillment is bringing the new heavens and the new earth into manifestation and having fellowship with the Father and Jesus forever. The feasts of the Lord are important to understand. There are seven feasts, three feast seasons. The first feast season is when Jesus Christ fulfilled that and the Passover lamb becoming sin on the very day of Pentecost, on the day, very day of Passover, which is the 14th day of the first month on the calendar, the lunar calendar, which is God's calendar. And then, having been made sin, he fulfilled the next one, unleavened bread, where for three days and three nights he was in the heart of the earth, paying the price for sin and accomplishing the redemption. The third feast, which is the Feast of First Fruits, was fulfilled then on the morrow after the Sabbath, after Jesus having been born from the dead, being born again in hell, and then preaching the gospel to the spirits that were in the upper compartment of hell, which were all the Old Testament saints, and they received it. They all got born again. Jesus came up. The ones came up out of hell as well that were in there, and they were seen in the streets. These are scriptures we've looked at, messages we've talked about in the past. And Jesus went up to heaven and poured out his blood on the mercy seat. He'd accomplished the eternal redemption for us. And so he fulfilled this in the first feast season. The second feast, feast, feast season is Pentecost, which was 50 days later when the Holy Spirit was poured out in order to bring forth a new birth for those who are alive on earth. It began the church age. And that was fulfilled by Jesus of Christ, of course, when he sent the Holy Spirit in, having received it of the Father, on the very day of Pentecost. He fulfilled all these on the exact day. The third feast season is in the fall, in the seventh Hebrew month, which is called Tishri, which is the time on the lunar calendar of either September or October, depending upon how it falls. This is the time of year when this all occurs. In fact, we're about the 14th day of the seventh month presently. And the three feast seasons in the seventh month speak of the second coming of Jesus Christ and the work that he does at that point in time. But there's also a prophetic fulfillment of all that he had accomplished during the church age as well when we speak about the seventh month. Well, today we're going to talk about the seventh month. The seventh month, whenever you see it in Scripture, it has some prophetic fulfillment aspect to it. This is important for us to understand. It reveals the work of Jesus Christ in order to accomplish the work of God for mankind. We begin in the first use of this in Genesis chapter 8, verse 4. The ark rested in the seventh month on the seventeenth day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. This is the time of the flood. The flood came to destroy all the wicked, all the ones who were evil. Of course, Noah and his, the one, his family, they're the ones that were preserved. He was the one who was righteous, did, obeyed God's commandments, was seen righteous in God's sight. And he was protected in the ark. The ark was a place of safety and protection from the judgment of the flood that was coming upon the earth. The ark then 
It says it rested on the seventh month. That's important in the seventh month because this also points towards the fulfillment of this work of Jesus Christ because the ark is a type of Jesus. He is the ark and he's where the manifest presence of God is to protect us and to bring us to all that he has for us. And we see that in the seventh month, this is talking about what Jesus brings. He brings rest in the seventh month. And what does he accomplish? He accomplishes not only the redemption, but he also accomplishes, accomplishes the judgment that's going to come upon the nations to destroy the works of the enemy and take back the earth for the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Now, when we talk about the seventh month, seven, seventh month on the 17th day, this is significant because the 17th day is a number, 17 is the number which means the ending of evil, the ending of evil or the effects of it. And this is important to understand because Jesus comes to end evil in the sense that we don't have to be bound by it any longer. We can be free from it. We can walk in the ways of righteousness and holiness and fellowship with the Lord and see the manifest presence of God. And notice, where did the ark come to rest upon? On the mountains of Ararat. The word Ararat means the curse reversed. That means Jesus Christ came to reverse the curse and he begins to accomplish that, of course, when he accomplished the redemption to bring man out of spiritual death unto spiritual life. But he also accomplishes that when he brings forth the judgment upon the world to eliminate those ungodly people from the world when Jesus comes to rule and the reign in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Seventeen is the number of evil ended or revealed to be ended in the earth. We can see that in many scriptures. We see, actually, the flood began, it says, in Genesis chapter 7, verse 11, 600th year of Noah's life in the second month, the 17th day of the month. That's when all the fountains of the deep, great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were open. It began to pour out this judgment upon them with the flood. It's the time of the judgment and the end of the evil men. We see another place where this number 17, over in Genesis chapter 37, verse 2, where it speaks of, in the latter part here, well, we read the first part, you see, these are the generations of Jacob and Joseph being 17 years old. 17 is the significant script number in Scripture. He's feeding the, feeding the flock with his brethren, and... Uh, the lad was with the sons of Bilhan, the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. He revealed the evil that what all these sons were doing, because he was the only one who was walking righteous before the Lord. So he brought to the father the evil report so he would know what they were like, and the revelation of the evil came forth. We see another case in Genesis chapter 47. Verse 28, Jacob lived in the land of Egypt. That was a place where they were in hard bondage. 17 years, that was the end. At the end of 17 years, then that's when he passed away, and that was when he was delivered out of there, and he was not buried there. 17 years was all that he was in, that place of evil. We see that there were kings that reigned who were evil kings, how long did they reign? They only got to reign 17 years before they were eliminated because that was the end of evil. This is Rehoboam, son of Solomon. He reigned. It says he reigned for 17 years in Jerusalem. And he did a lot of evil. Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, provoked them to jealousy with all their sins that they committed. They carried a lot of evil out there. We see another king, Second Kings. Chapter 13, verse 1. Here's where it speaks of Jehoaz, the son of Jehu, began to reign over Israel and Samaria, and he reigned 17 years as well. That's all. He did evil on the sight of the Lord as well, and, well, and followed the sins of Jeroboam. 
17 is the number of the ending of evil reigning or operating. And we see another place where this is important, and we talked about this. You must understand that when Adam fell and disobeyed God and was committed treason against God and was separated, spiritually died that day, now he gave that authority into the hands of Satan. God had given the earth into the hands of men for a period of time, which was 6,000 years, the six days of man operating and ruling in the earth. For 6,000 years, man has had, had a lease to operate. This lease was in place. We can see this, actually, the lease that was given to man. It refers to this in Luke chapter 20, over in verse 9. He began to speak, speak a parable to the people. A certain man planted a vineyard, let it, let it out to husband. The word let means to give out, like to let out for hire, like a lease. And it's speaking here of the fact that God gave a lease into the hands of man. Well, he gave it into the hands of Satan. Satan now became the one who had authority over the earth. And he could, how, why could he operate as long as he was able to operate? Why didn't God get rid of him right away? He couldn't, because God does things according to what is right. And the lease had been given into the hands of man, and he gave it into the hands of Satan. Now Satan had the le right of the lease to control the earth for 6,000 years. In order to get rid of that and to take back the earth, the lease would have to expire, but also someone would have to come and would have to purchase the title deed to the earth which was given into the hands of man, which was then given into the hands of Satan. In Jeremiah chapter 32, we talked about this, but it speaks of Hanamiel, God's grace. He was the son of Shalom, Shalom retribution to pay back and get, in order to obtain what God wanted. He comes to him and says, buy my field that's in Anathoth. Anathoth means affliction, and it speaks of the earth in affliction under the dominion of Satan. And he says, for the right of redemption is thine to buy it. And Jeremiah means God's appointed one. He was appointed to buy this field for God, for the right of redemption, because this is all a part of what God had to accomplish, the redemption of the earth. Not only the redemption of man, but also the redemption of earth. So, here he comes. He says, By my field I pray this in Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin. Meaning, Benjamin would be involved in getting this, buying this field and obtaining this, this title deed to this particular land. Benjamin means the son of the right hand. Who's the son of the right hand? Jesus. Jesus is the one who is going to come and is going to take back the earth and buy this title deed. Why was he able to do it? Because he had the right of inheritance. Remember, Jesus is the heir, and he's the heir of all things. You and I become joint heirs when we receive him. And he goes on and says, For the right of inheritance is thine, and the, the redemption. This word, gula, la, means a right of redemption as well, meaning he had a right of inheritance and a right of redemption. So what's he going to do? As the one who has the right of inheritance, the right of redemption, he's going to buy back this land, purchase it, and Jesus did this through his mighty work of redemption. And we see, I bought the field of Hanamiel, my uncle's son that was in Anathoth, and weighed in the money, and what did he pay for it? Seventeen shekels. The number, seventeen. Because what was number seventeen? Seventeen is the number that ends the evil in the earth. And that's exactly what Jesus was going to do. And remember, he said that here it ended on the seventeenth day on the mountains of Ararat, Ararat, which means the curse reversed. Jesus Christ comes to purchase back the earth, and he does this in the second coming of Jesus Christ in order to bring the earth back into the hands of God for the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. 
And this is what he did. This is why Revelation chapter 5 talks about what Jesus had to do. Remember in Revelation chapter 5, after the judgment that's come upon the church in Revelation 2 and 3, now we're seeing what's going to happen for the judgment upon the nations. It begins in Revelation 6, but what's going to precede that? Somebody has to be able to do this, and he has to take back the title deed to the earth and bring the judgments upon the nations. Revelation 5.1, I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside. Something that was written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals, that's the title deed to something. And this is speaking of the title deed to the earth. He saw a strong angel, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who's worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Had to be somebody worthy to do it. Not anybody could do it. No man in heaven and earth, neither upon earth, was able to open the book. Nobody could do this. But somebody could do it. He was weeping, of course, because they didn't have anybody to open it. And this is necessary in order to take back the earth and bring the judgments upon the nations. One of the elders said to me in verse 5, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed. The word prevailed is the word nakao, which means to conquer and carry off the victory. He conquered and carried off the victory over the devil. He defeated him, and because of the fact that he prevailed, in his first come, he accomplished the redemption to restore man to relationship with God. In the second coming, he's coming to destroy the nations and to take back possession of the earth, to bring the judgment. Notice, who what's he called here? The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He came as a lamb the first time to pay the price for sin. Now he's coming as a lion. The lion's coming to bring judgment. The root of David has conquered to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. Jesus Christ is the one who accomplishes this great work. This is all completed in the second coming of Jesus, which is in the seventh month, and that is important. Now, when did Jesus come on the scene? When was he born? This also has to do with the seventh month. The seventh month is the month showing forth Jesus Christ's mighty work. And you must understand the time when he was born was the seventh month. He wasn't born on December 25th. That's a huge lie. It's an absolute lie. That was the day of the sun god. The Catholic Church appointed that day, the birthday of Jesus, to coincide with the merger of the pagans into the church. All false, all lies. He wasn't born then whatsoever. John chapter 1, verse 14. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The Word is who? Jesus. Became flesh, a man. Dwelt. This is the word skenoo, which means to tabernacle. That tells you when he was born. He was born at the time of tabernacles. When's that? The seventh month. Luke chapter 2. Came to pass in those days that went out a decree from Caesar Augustus, all the world should be taxed. This is the time when Jesus came back. The tax was not in the rainy season, which was from November to February. Instead, it was in the fall, right after the time of their crops, the harvest. That would have been the time of the seventh month. Here, this taxing that they had. Also, it says that Joseph went in up there to the city of David, to Bethlehem. He was the house and lineage of David to be taxed. Mary was about to give birth. This is the time of the birth of Jesus. And so here she was, the days were accomplished, so she'd be delivered. And we come forth, and he was now born, and he was, they laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Why was there no room for them in the inn? Because everybody had come in for tabernacles, and they didn't have any rooms that they could find. Tabernacles was in the seventh month, not in the middle of the rainy season in December, which is all a lie. They're in the same country the shepherds abide in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. The shepherds were out in the field prior to the rainy season, and they were watching over the flock, so the sheep were out there. Again, this is also at that same time. So this is the time of the birth of Jesus. But another thing that we know, that the time of the birth of Jesus was in the seventh month, because in Luke chapter 1, 
and verse 24. We can tell it by the birth, the birth of Jesus at this time because of what we see about the time from John the Baptist's birth. Luke 1, 24, here's when Elizabeth conceived. She's the mother of John the Baptist. She comes here in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth, espoused to this virgin. Angel came into her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Elizabeth had conceived six months before Mary had conceived by the Holy Spirit. We see that Elizabeth went full term. We see in Luke 1, 57, Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered. So that'd be the full nine months. The same thing happened with Mary. She carried the child full term as well. Luke 2, 6. It was while they were there, the days were accomplished, that she should be delivered. So we have the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy. We have the nine months of Mary's pregnancy. So we have 15 months. If we can determine the time of Elizabeth's conception, we would add 15 months and we would know the time of the birth of Jesus Christ. Can we know this? Absolutely. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. It's the days of Herod. Zacharias, Elizabeth's husband, he was a priest. And the priest had their duties in certain courses, which were two-week periods of time. And he was of the course of Abaya. The course of Abaya was the eighth course. And the eighth course is when they went in and they carried out their particular duties. And it was at this time, during when he, they had, she had no child, of course, and while he was executing the priest's office before God, at this particular time in the eighth course, that's when he went in, and of course the angel appeared to him, and this is when the angel told him, in verse 13, Fear not, Zacharias, your prayers heard. Thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and you shall call his name John. And so, of course, after that was done, of course, then she conceived right after that. This course of Abiah, that we talk about. It is the eighth course, and that is important to understand. We see the courses of the priest listed out in 1 Chronicles 24, and we come down to verse 5. It speaks of all these that were divided by lot, the different ones. And here was the first lot, and it began to list out the different courses there were. We come down to the eighth one, the eighth course, which was Abijah, the same as Abiah, as it spoke of in Luke chapter 1. The time of this would be on the Hebrew calendar, the lunar calendar. The fourth course would have been the time of what would be considered to be June and July. That would be the fourth Hebrew month. Because it was the eighth course, which is the second half of that fourth month, there were two weeks for each. Two weeks and two weeks would be the first one, that would be the first two courses. Third and fourth would be the second one. Four, fifth and sixth would be the third one. Seventh and eighth would be the fourth one, fourth month. The eighth course then would become the second half of June, July, which would bring it into July. That's the time when he was conceived. If we take July and we go 15 months, where do we end up? We end up in October, which is the time, the second half of the seventh month, which is the time when Jesus was born. And when was that? The second half of the month begins there at the middle of the month, and that's when Tabernacles is, the seventh month, the 15th day. Jesus was born at the time of the seventh month. Why? Because the seventh month is prophetic of God coming to end evil and accomplish this great and mighty work. Jesus was born. Now, the next thing we need to realize is also Jesus began his ministry at the same time in the seventh month. And this is all the full first fulfillment of the Day of Atonement, which is the Jubilee. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 9. Thou shalt cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. 
The seventh month, tenth day, is the Day of Atonement, which is the Day of Judgment. And this particular day, it says, they would hallow the 50th year, it was every 50 years, proclaiming liberty throughout all the land and to all the inhabitants. It was a time where they would go free, free from all their debts, free from all their bondages, return back to their house, all their possessions were returned. You return every man unto his possession, and you return every man unto his family. Total restoration. The Jubilee. The Jubilee was a holy time, and they would eat the increase there of the field. In the Jubilee, they would return every man to his possession. Now, so the Jubilee all talks about freedom and freedom and liberty and coming out of bondage. The spiritual revelation is one coming to bring us out of spiritual bondage and to deliver us and heal us and restore us. This is exactly what Jesus Christ came to do. It was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me. The Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings of the meat. That's the gospel. Sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, open a prison to them that are bound, bringing deliverance and healing and liberty, which is what Jubilee was all about. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The acceptable year of the Lord was the year of Jubilee, when they were, went free. And that's what he came to bring forth. Why was he proclaiming the acceptable year of the Lord? Because he was the fulfillment of the Jubilee at the beginning of the seventh month when he began his ministry. It says the day of vengeance of our God as well. That's another aspect of the day of atonement fulfillment. But this one was not fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus. This is going to be fulfilled in the second coming of Jesus. The reason we say that, notice it said he proclaimed the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of our God. Where is this quoted in the New Testament speaking of it when it began to be fulfilled? In Luke chapter 4. In Luke chapter 4, we see over in verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to heal the broken heart, to preach deliverance to the captives, to bring a release from bondage and imprisonment. Now we can cast out the demons, we can be healed and delivered and set free. To recover the sight of the blind, to set at liberty, same thing, release from bondage and imprisonment from them that are bruised. And then he says, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, which is the year of Jubilee, the restoration and the liberty, restoring of all things and the, the liberty, returning the people coming out of bondage. And then he stopped. He didn't say the day of the judgment of our eyes. He stopped. He closed the book. He quit reading at that point and gave it again to the minister. Why? Because all Jesus came was to fulfill the first part, not the second part at that point in time. So he sits down, and then he says to them, he began to say to them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. What scripture? The scripture of the promise of the Messiah bringing the liberty, which is the fulfillment of the first fulfillment of the Day of Atonement, which was the Jubilee, which was fulfilled on the seventh day, tenth month was the Jubilee, in order to bring forth liberty. When he says fulfilled, this is significant of the tense in the Greek. The tenses in the Greek are important to understand because they tell exactly the time. Perfect tense. Perfect tense in the Greek means action completed in the past with present effects at the time of speaking. In other words, what it's saying is this day, this scripture, the Isaiah 61, which he quoted in Luke 4, has already been fulfilled and it's in effect today in your ears. That's because Jesus had already begun his ministry at this point in time. We can show you this because you have to understand what Jesus was doing. Mark chapter 1 verse 9 came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, was baptized of John and Jordan. What happened immediately after that? Here the Spirit of the, of the Lord came upon him, the Holy Spirit descending upon him, it says. He says, there's a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And immediately the Spirit drives him into the wilderness. This would have been the temptation. And how long did the temptation go on 
from the devil for 40 days. When did Jesus begin his ministry? On the seventh month, tenth day, the beginning of the Day of Atonement for the beginning of that ministry. Forty days back before that would take you when? It'd take you back to the beginning of the preceding month because the months are 30 days. The preceding month is called a lull, which is the month of repentance. So Jesus was tempted during that entire 30 days plus the first 10 days of the seventh month leading up to the seventh month, 10th day. So the 40 day period. And he accomplished the, the coming through the temptation, being ready to start his ministry. Then, John was put in prison. Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Why is he preaching the gospel of the kingdom? Because the fulfillment of the time had come. And how do we know that? Because he said it. Mark 1.15, saying, The time is fulfilled. He's speaking about something important here. What time? Perfect tense again. It has been fulfilled. And the kingdom of God's at hand, meaning that it is near. It has come near. When it says at hand, it really means to be something that is brought near. And because, again, it's perfect tense, it's saying that this has been brought near. It's now in manifestation. Repent. Change your mind and believe the gospel. What was this time? The time is the word kairos in the Greek, which means a fixed, definite time. And what was that? That was the fixed, definite time when Jesus would begin his ministry. And he was the jubilee on the seventh month, tenth day, the beginning of the fulfillment of the Day of Atonement. And how long was Jesus going to minister? For three and a half years. From the seventh month, tenth day, Three and a half years would take you three years and then another six months to the first month, tenth day. And what happened on the first month, tenth day? That's when Jesus came in, riding on the colt, having salvation, proclaiming the fact of who he is, and he is the king. They were declaring he was the king because he was coming to accomplish the redemption, having completed his ministry. The time of the jubilee fulfillment the, of the Day of Atonement, of the liberty to be proclaimed. And what did Jesus do during the whole time? He cast out the demons. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He set people free. He preached the gospel. He brought, declared the liberty that now was, came through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he accomplished this great and mighty work. Remember, the second fulfillment, though, goes back to Isaiah 61, as we see, and this is going to be fulfilled in the second coming of Jesus, the day of vengeance of our God. And that will also happen on the seventh month, tenth day. God does things exactly on the day. Seventh month, tenth day, that's the battle of Armageddon, the judgment that comes on the nations and the destruction of all of the nations, destruction of most everybody on earth at that time. We have, already, have been caught up to meet the Lord in the air ten days later on the time of the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets, and we come back with him after the marriage supper of the Lamb, as we talked about. And then Jesus is going to begin the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, which will be on tabernacles, tabernacles, which is again on the, the, uh, coming up on the 15th day, which is actually tomorrow on the, the cal lunar calendar. We're looking at, though, the fulfillment of this, everything it says about the seventh month. The gospel is to be preached during the seventh month, or during, during the church season, and culminating, culminating in the seventh month with the completion of the work being done in the church and the gospel being preached in all the world. Remember, it's going to be preached in all the world for a witness in all the nations before the end comes. It's going to be accomplished. In order to do that, it does take finances to do this. God has set his way of finances, not only for the functioning of the church, for all the different purposes, also below for the preaching of the gospel. In 2 Chronicles chapter 31 and verse 5, this is the time of Hezekiah. As soon as the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits 
That's the tithe of the corn, wine, and oil, and honey, and all the increase of the field, and the tithe of all things brought they in abundantly. Concerning the children of Israel and Judah that dwelt in the cities of Judah, they brought in the tithe of tithes of oxen, sheep, tithes of holy things, consecrated to the Lord, and laid them up by heaps. They had heaps of them. They were coming in. In the third month, they began to, the foundation, to lay this foundation of the heaps. What's the third month? Siwan. What happened the third month? That's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, which began the church age. And when did they finish them? Finish this on the seventh month. What's the seventh month? That's the time, of, again, the second coming of Jesus, and that's at the end of the church age. It was four months long. So during the church age of four months, which is 2,000 years, this is the time when all the tithes are brought in, and they brought them in heaps. And by the time here at the end of the seventh month, they had tremendous heaps. What this means is, during the church age, the church is to have been brought the tithes and the offerings for the preaching of the gospel, and these, it comes in in heaps such that there'll be a tremendous move of God because of all the finances available to bring the preaching of the gospel. There'll be no lack whatsoever. This is why everybody is to be a tither and to bring all this in. Because of the tremendous heaps, here they had enough to eat, they had left plenty, the Lord blesses people, they had a great store of all the finances that was necessary to carry out what they want. And God, of course, has set it for the tithes and the offerings to be brought in for the preaching of the gospel. And so it, throughout this period, and it will culminate with the preaching of the gospel throughout the entire world, every nation will see the gospel preached. In Ezra chapter 3, we see something further about the seventh month. And remember, this is all prophetic of the fulfillment of Jesus Christ's work in the church, especially leading up right to the second coming of Jesus. Ezra 3, 1. When the seventh month was come, the children of Israel in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man, become one. The word akkad means a compound one, Every, a group becoming one. And that's exactly what's going to happen because Jesus, in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, which we'll just run over to for a moment, in John 17, when he prayed, one of the things he prayed for, verse 21, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art one, I and thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The church is going to come, we're talking about the remnant, they're going to come to the place of being one. Unfortunately, as we talked about the last time, there's going to be a fall away. A fall away, a defection, an apostasy from truth by the many who are not going to follow the way of the Lord. But the few, the remnant, will follow, and they will be one, and they will be mighty. And this is going to be fulfilled in the end time church before Jesus comes back. Ezra chapter 3, we come down to verse 6. From the first day of the seventh month, and when you see something talking about from the first day of the seventh month, it's talking about this end time work right before Jesus comes back, and there is going to be a tremendous work being accomplished. The first day of the seventh month began they to offer the burnt offering to the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. The foundation's got to be laid. Well, in verse 8, in the second year of the coming of the house of God of Jerusalem, the second month, these ones and the remnant of their brethren, the priests and Levites, all that were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem, appointed the Levites from 20 years old and up, they set forward the work of the house of the Lord. This tells you something. When did this happen after they came out of the captivity? You and I have come out of spiritual captivity the day we're born again. From that point on, what is supposed to happen? We are just have set forward the work of the house of the Lord, the building of the house of the Lord in you. Unfortunately, the church has not done what they should have done. The early church had great glory because they did what was necessary. From that time on, there's not been a manifestation of the glory of God like what there was in the early church. 
in the latter end time church there'll be a greater glory because the work will be accomplished. God will accomplish this great mighty work. Verse 10, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets. So the foundation gets laid. How is the foundation laid? We've talked about that by being a hearer and a doer of the word consistently in your life in all aspects. We'll lay the foundation of the house of the Lord. You're the, you and I are the temple. Verse 11, they sang together by course and praising, giving thanks unto the Lord. He's good, his mercy endureth forever towards Israel. And the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Once the foundation's laid, the enemy can't even shake you anymore, remember? You've got to come out of captivity and you've got to get the foundation laid by getting delivered, getting healed, getting set free, being a hearer and a doer of the word, being totally established in walking in the ways of the word of God. That is how the foundation of the house of the Lord gets laid. Now, as this work was going forth, ah, the enemy tries to hinder it. Ezra 4, 2. These are enemies that came to Zerubbabel. The chief of the fathers said to him, let us build with you. The enemy tries to come along and do something with them. For we seek your God as you do. They're liars, of course. They weren't. They're liars. The devil lies to you. And we do sacrifice unto him since the days of this particular king of Asher. Now, they were a lion. Zerubbabel and Jeshua, the, the, Jeshua the, the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel, said to him, You have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God. Now, they weren't deceived. They understood the lying deceit, deceit that was trying to affect them. We ourselves together will build in the house of God, Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. But the enemy is working against them. And you have to understand the enemy will try to work against you. In the seventh month is the completion of the building of the house of the Lord, going on to perfection where the glory of God manifests in the remnant that's become one. The enemy will try to stop the work of God in your life. You've got to guard yourself. The people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in the building. The devil will try to weaken you and trouble you in the building. That's why you've got to get strong. You've got to be strong in order to see this work accomplished. You get strong through the Word of God, hearing and doing it. You get weak because of sin, the world, the flesh, anything that's not of God. That's why you've got to be totally committed to walk in the ways of the Lord. Verse 5, they hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. The devil will do anything possible to try to frustrate the purpose of God in seeing the building of the house of God in your life. They were successful. Came down to verse 24, and they then ceased the work of the house of God at Jerusalem. God tries to stop the work. Do not ever let the work of God be stopped or cease in your life. You need to be working the work of God every day in the Word, hearing the Word, doing the Word, working out your own salvation, conquering enemies, walking in victory, growing, increasing, abounding in all things. Well, then Haggai and Zechariah come and prophesied to them and got them going again at what they were to do because they got off track. The Word of God came, they spoke the Word and told them what they were to do. And this speaks of the end time Word of God that's coming forth from those who are speaking the truth, commanding the work of God to come forth in the house of the Lord and to see this great work be accomplished before the coming of Jesus Christ. In Ezra 5, 2, they began to build the house of God. That's what they were supposed to be doing. They, allow, they allowed themselves to get hindered. They even stopped the work. It ceased. You've got to get on track and start doing what God wants. The body of Christ has become lukewarm in many ways, become grafted in with things of the world, seeker-sensitive, music of the world, all these things. Don't even have three services a week hardly anymore, hardly any churches, because they can't get anybody to come. Short services, don't tell, I want short services, not too long, you know, all this kind of stuff. You can tell they're not on fire for the Lord. They play church on one day and the rest of the day live in the flesh or live in the world and walk after their own ways. <laughs> That's not the things of God whatsoever. The building of the house of God will be done by those who are the remnant who are going to walk in the ways of the Lord consistently. 
And we see over in Nehemiah, further, it talks about this mighty work being accomplished. The seventh month. Anytime you see the seventh month, you've got to pay attention to what's being said. In Nehemiah 7, 73, the priests, Levites, porters, singers, some of the people, and Nethanins, all the Israel dwelt in their cities. When the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities. What needs to happen? The Word of God has to come to you because that's how it's going to build you. You've got to get the knowledge of God and see the building of the house of God come forth. 8 verse 1. All the people gathered themselves together as one man. This is the remnant who are going to come together as one. The Echad, the one man. Compound. Into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had commanded in Israel. This remnant, they want to hear the word. They don't want to hear social sermons. They don't want to hear pump-me-up sermons. They don't want to hear things, you know, just carry on about whatever. No. They don't want to hear jokes and entertainment. They want to hear the word. They want the word. Bring the word out. Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the congregation, both the men and women, all that could hear with understanding. He brought the law, the Word of God, so it would bring the understanding. God wants you to get the knowledge of God and the spiritual understanding and get wisdom. And this is, again, the first day of the seventh month. So this is talking about end-time fulfillment in this end-time church. What'd they do? He read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday. Do they want them to come and bring the Word out and just give me a scripture and then I'll go my way? No. Morning is talking about daybreak at dawn. That would speak of like six in the morning. Midday was the halfway point, which would have been like noon. They were reading the word for six hours to these people. These guys wanted the word. They didn't want just give me a scripture or two. They wanted to hear the word. Six hours of continually hearing the word before the men and women and those who could understand. And notice, the ears of the people were attentive under the book of the law. They wanted to know. They were paying attention. They wanted to learn the Word of God. They wanted to get the knowledge of God. Talks about down in verse 7. These ones caused the people to understand, and the people stood in their place. As the Word is coming forth, God wants you to get spiritual knowledge and spiritual understanding. So you can walk in the way of the Lord. Remember, if you don't have understanding, the devil takes it out of your heart, the word that you hear. So these are the people that are building their house. These are the people becoming strong. These are people getting spiritual understanding of the things of God. And then verse 8, it says, So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly. The word distinctly is interesting. It's a word meaning that something is declared to clarify it and to bring it exactly, accurately to them. Young's brings it out, explaining so as to give meaning. Otherwise, making sure that they understood it clearly and they got the meaning of it. They just didn't hear something and went on their way. These guys got the word explained. It's going to be scripture after scripture, point after point, to teach them the truth so that they would get the true understanding. They explain it. They get the knowledge. They gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. That is what God wants. That's why we bring forth what we do, scripture after scripture, point after point, to bring the revelation of the truth being taught accurately. None of this preachy stuff, none of this jokey stuff or pump me up services, which a whole lot of churches have resorted to these days, which is a mistake. They're not going to be a part of the end time group whatsoever. Also, we come down here to verse 14, and it speaks here. They found in the law which Moses commanded by Moses that children of Israel should dwell in booze in the feast of the seventh month. What's all the booze about? That was temporary shelters. What's that all about? You've got to understand you're in a temporary dwelling. Your house, your physical body is a temporary dwelling place, meaning you're not going to be there forever. You know why? Because we're going to get a new body. We're going to get a glorified body. And also, the temporary dwelling place is in the earth. We're not always going to be in this earth. This earth will be here through the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, but then it's going to be eliminated. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. This one's going to, all going to be burned up. 
because it's been contaminated by the sin, and there'll be a brand new one. So this speaks of all these things being fulfilled in the seventh month when you and I are going to get, we've been, aware, we've been dwelling in temporary booze, but we're not going to be in temporary booze anymore. We're going to get a glorified body. And then eventually the final fulfillment is there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth that is going to come forth. Now as the word of God is coming forth, now, there's always the false out there. We know the doctrines of the devils are in the church and the false prophets and false teachers are out there. They're all over the place, unfortunately. It's not to be, but it's, it happens. Jeremiah 28, verse 17 tells us something. Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. Ah, when you see the seventh month, you say, this is going to happen in the end times. This means the false prophets, which was what Hananiah was, are going to die. God's not going to put up with this falseness in the end. He's going to have a remnant that is going to be walking in one accord as one man, united in the way of the Lord, coming to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the exact knowledge of the Son of God to the perfect man, growing up to the man of Christ in perfection, the glorious church. In fact, what I'm just quoting for, I'll come back to in a moment. But this is what the fulfillment of what God's going to bring forth. Ephesians 4, 11. The apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, these are the true ones. For the perfecting of the saints, we are going to grow up and go on into maturity and perfection. For the work of the ministry, you're going to be doing the work of the ministry. You're not going to be sitting around doing nothing. For the edifying of the body of Christ, the body of Christ is to grow up and become strong and mighty. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge, the precise, correct knowledge of the Son of God, to what? To the perfect man. The Bible speaks of when the foundation is laid, that we go on to perfection. And the body of Christ is going to come to perfection in the final last days before the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The fullness of Christ is going to come in the body of Christ in these last days. Now, what was the problem here, back here in Jeremiah? Is God going to put up with any of this false stuff? No. It's going to be dealt with. Remember, there's going to be a fall-away group. Who are the fall-away ones? The ones that apostatized, the ones that won't walk in the way of the Lord. There's only going to be a remnant that are going to be with him. And the remnant of the ones who are going to be as one, walking in one accord with the Lord, walking in truth. Well, we see in Jeremiah 28, here's where this prophet was speaking, and the things that he was speaking were false. He was telling the people things that weren't true. In verse 9, the prophet which prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then that prophet shall be known that the Lord hath truly sent him, if that's true. Well, Hananiah was prophesying some things, and he was declaring, I will break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, from the neck of all nations within the space of two full years. In two years, you'll be free from Babylon. You'll be free from Nebuchadnezzar. It's a lie. He were going into captivity for 70 years. He was giving them a false hope, a false lie, telling them a bunch of things that they want to hear instead of telling them the truth. Huh. That was wrong. The word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the prophet after that Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke from off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Go and tell Hananiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast broken the yokes of wood, but thou shalt make for them yokes of iron. He goes on and he says that they're going to serve him. They're going to serve this, this king of Babylon. And we come down here to verse 15. The prophet Jeremiah said unto Hananiah, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee. You make this people to trust in a lie, believing, oh, in two years everything will be fine. No. It's a lie. All these ones that are preaching anything that's contrary to the truth is a lie, and they're false teachers, they're false prophets, and they're all going to be judged. They're going to be in trouble. Therefore saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth. This year you shall die because you have taught rebellion against the Lord. And so Hananiah the prophet died the same year. When? In the seventh month. What's going to happen? The false prophets are going to die. 
they're going to be eliminated. They're going to be judged. God's going to have truth come forth in the last days. Also, what is operating in the earth? The Babylonian system. The Babylonian system of sin, lawlessness, total disobedience to God, rejection of the ways of God's ways, the new world order, that's all the Babylonian system. That's what we see. You see all these ones that, want, that don't want borders and the nations? God's the one who set the nations. They want to bring us into a one world order and destroy this nation. They speak of it. These guys are all evil as ever. All these leftists and socialists and communists. I trust you. I understand that. They're evil. They're all of the devil. They're all after the Babylonian system. And they're in trouble. See, that's why we have to get rid of all these leaders that are bought by the ones who have the, the money barons of this world who've been controlling everything. Well, in 2 Kings chapter 25, very interesting, because everything you see about the seventh month, it's significant for the end time. 2 Kings 25, 25, it came to pass in the seventh month, aha, end time fulfillment about something, that Ishmael, He's a bad guy. The son of Nethaniah, the son of this, these kids, of the seed of the royal, came and ten men with him, and he smote Gedaliah, and he died. They killed him. They got rid of him. Who was Gedaliah? After Nebuchadnezzar had come and taken the Jews to captivity in Babylon, there were some that were left. Verse 22, As for the people that remained in the land of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had left, even over them he made Galiliah, the son of Anakim, the son of Japhon, Japhon, the ruler. So this guy is the ruler. Well, was he going to be an okay guy? No, he was under Babylon. Galiliah swore to them and to their men and said unto them, Fear not to be the servants of the Chaldees, that was the Babylonians. Dwell in the land and serve the king of Babylon, it shall be well with you. Go ahead and just go along with the New World Order and the Babylonian agenda and just follow the lawlessness and all the things that they tell you to do. Oh, you're going to be destroyed. It will not be well with you. Was he preaching the truth? No. He was a liar. In fact, in Jeremiah, chapter 40, he was telling the wrong thing to do. We see down in verse 14. Dost thou certainly know that by Baalus, the king of the Ammonites, has sent Ishmael, the son of Nephaniah, to slay thee? So Ishmael, the guy who killed him, he was a bad guy, son of the Ammonites, who were the enemies. This would speak of evil kingdoms out there in the earth who were going to come and kill those ones like Gedaliah, who are the ones who have submitted to Babylon. If you submit to Babylon... The enemies, the kings, are going to wipe you out and you'll be martyred out in these last days. You won't make it till the rapture, that's for sure. That's what happens. And what was the problem? They were fellowshipping, not only submitting to them, they were fellowshipping with them. Here, they were all gathered together. We come down to chapter uh, 41, 1. Came to pass in the seventh month, seventh month again, Ishmael, this one, they came unto Gedaliah, and there they did eat bread together with him. Ah, that means they were in fellowship with him. You can't be in fellowship with anybody that's, that's not right whatsoever. And what happened to him? Ah, he was finished, didn't he? Ishmael rose up, and he smote him, and he slew him, and he killed him. Why? Because he was in the Babylonian camp. He was following the ways of the world. Remember, this is a seventh-month fulfillment. What does it speak about Babylon in Revelation chapter 18 to the people of God? We see it talks about how Babylon's going to fall. All the uncleanness in it is going to be exposed. All its fornication and adulteries, all the different things it's done. But what does it say about the people of God? In Revelation 18.4, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. You can't be a part of the Babylonian system. You can't submit to the New World Order. You can't submit to the, these ones that want to destroy this nation and bring in socialism and bring in all these kind of things. It's all evil. Be not partakers of her sins that you receive not of her plagues. If you 
agree with that and go along with their sins, you're going to get the plagues. You're going to have curses coming upon you. And what this means, the ones who are all involved in the Babylonian system, you will not be protected. You'll be taken out. You will not make it through. You will be killed. The same time, remember this mighty remnant, this one accord, one man, hearing the word, foundation laid, growing up in all things, getting spiritual understanding, walking in the ways of the Lord, is going to be raised up mightily. 1 Kings chapter 8. Here's where Solomon, we go back for a moment. All the work, it says, ended all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord. The temple of Solomon is a type of the church. And this refers to the work being done in the end time church to bring it to be the perfected church, the dedicated church unto the Lord. Here it speaks of these ones. And they're going to, what are they going to do? He assembled all the elders of Israel, all the heads of the tribes and the chiefs of the fathers of the children of Israel and King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord. That's the presence of God coming in. And all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto King Solomon at the feast in the month Ethanim. This isn't Tishri, this is Ethanim. Ethanim, it says it's the seventh month. Ethanim was the name of the month before they went to Babylon, where they changed it to Tishri, because Babylon, or Tishri, is a Babylonian name when they were in captivity. But the name before, Ethanim, means living streams flowing, when you look it up in lexicons. Living streams flowing. What's that mean? There's going to be a river of living streams that are going to flow out of the end time church mightily before the end comes. It's going to happen. Now, this house that's going to be finished, 2 Chronicles chapter 5, they finished the house. It's now dedicated. They all assembled before the king to bring up this ark. Verse 5, they brought up the ark, the tabernacle, the congregation, all the holy vessels. Who are the holy vessels? You and me. Come to the place of being holy before the Lord. What are they doing? They're offering up a tremendous number of sacrifices, a multitude that could not be numbered. We talked about that in the spiritual sacrifices of offering yourself as a sacrifice unto God that you're going to, your whole life is going to be a sacrifice. You're going to be offering up continual sacrifices unto him in everything that you do. In verse 9, this is when they drove the, drew the staves out of the ark, meaning the ark wasn't going to move anymore. Who wears the ark? That's in us, the temple of God. That's the presence of God to be manifest. God is coming into the church to manifest himself, and he's not going to move, and he's going to manifest his glory in the end-time church that has come to the place of being holy before him. What's in the ark? Which would be what's in us. There's nothing in the ark save the two tables which Moses put therein. What was that? The law, which is the word of God. What's going to be in the end-time church? The ones that are the remnant. The Word of God. Nothing else is going to be in you. You get rid of all the uncleanness, all the garbage, all the filthiness. The only thing that's going to be in you is the Word, or else you won't be a part of this group. What about all these ones of the priests? And you and I are priests. They get sanctified. That means they come to the place of being holy. In verse 12, they're arrayed in white linen which is righteousness. The white linen is the righteousness of the saints. They've come to the place of being righteous. What else about these guys? They've come to the place of being one, one accord in the ways of the Lord. And what happens to them having met the conditions? The house, which is the church, you and me, is filled with a cloud, the house of the Lord. What's that? It's the glory of the Lord fills the house of God. That is going to happen to the end time church before the end comes. That is what God wants. At the same time, there's going to be this living waters poured out. We see in Psalms 46, 
it speaks of these waters that are going to come out in the end times. Verse 1, God's our refuge and strength, very present help in trouble. When the tribulation comes on the scene, it's going to be a very troublous time. Therefore will we not fear, though the earth be removed, that's earthquakes, mountains be carried in the midst of the sea, islands are going to be total upheaval, they're going to be tossed down, the whole face of the earth is going to start be looking different because of all the upheaval. The waters therefore roar and be troubled, the rages of the sea are going to be happening. The mountains shake with a the swelling thereof, earthquakes all over the place. But what does he say? There's a river. The streams that were will make the glad the city of God, and you and I are the city of God. He's come to dwell in us. The holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. Ah, the tabernacles is the place of dwelling. Where's the dwelling place? You and me. What kind of place is it? It's a holy place place. Those that are holy are going to be a part of this group where the streams, the river, is going to come out of you. God is in the midst of her. God will be in the midst of you and me. And I guarantee you, he won't be in anybody that's not holy. He only comes to manifest himself in a holy vessel. She shall not be moved. You won't be moved by anything. God shall help her, and that right early Right in the very beginning, the break of dawn, which means from the very beginning when all these things start to happen in the earth with all the judgments. The heathen raged. Oh, they're, they're, they're going to go crazy out there in the world when they see these things happen. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice and the earth melted. That means the destruction of all of these kingdoms is going to come forth of the world. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. He's your protection. He will protect us. Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he's made in the earth. This is the devastation, the destruction, the judgment that is going to come in these last days. In fact, after that, he'll make wars to cease into the end of the earth. Because as is talking about the millennial reign now, it shifts into that, where there won't be any more war. Well, this tremendous outpouring is in the seventh month. Because in John chapter 7, we see in verse 37, At the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. The last day of the feast is the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles in the seventh month, meaning this is going to be accomplished in the end time church. He that believeth on me, the real believers we're talking about, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. There's going to be rivers coming out of the church. And these rivers are going to be tremendous in order to see the mighty end-time work of the Lord be done. If you think you're going to sit around and do nothing, you're not going to be a part of this group. Ezekiel 47 speaks of the house and the waters that came out from under the house. And they're coming out from all the different sides of the house, which speaks of all the ones who are in the house. All the believers are going to have these waters in them coming out of them. And it speaks of the waters. He starts to measure these waters that are in the house. He brought me through the waters. The waters were to the ankles. Me measures it again. Now the waters are to the knees. They're going to rise in the house of God, which is the church. Now the waters are to the loins. They keep on getting more. And then it comes to the place of a river that could not pass over. The river of God is coming into you, which is the water of God, which is the word of God coming into you. That you will be a river of living water, living streams flowing out of you and bringing forth what God purposes to see people be born again, to see them be delivered, to be them be set free. He comes to the brink of the river. And he says, on the river, there are very many trees. Well, the trees are you and me. And we have the river of God in us, you remember. And all these trees here now, he says, everything that liveth, which, everything that liveth which moveth, wherever the river shall come, shall live. Otherwise, it's going to make life. Life is going to come out of you so powerfully with this powerful anointing of the end time church. Notice, there shall be a great 
very great multitude of fish. What's that mean? That's souls being one. Remember he said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Because of these waters shall come thither, they shall, be he they shall be healed, and everything that live where the river cometh, everything is going to get healed. There's going to be tremendous healing and deliverance that is going to come forth at the same time. He speaks that the fish shall be according to their kinds, exceeding amount, great, exceeding great amount, that will be a tremendous amount of fish will come forth. And he goes on over in verse 12. He says, By the river upon the bank thereof, on this side, on that side, grow all the trees for meat, whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to the months, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. Total restoration, the river of God, coming forth in the body of Christ. All these things prophesied in the end times. Tremendous move of God. Over in Hagehi, we're going a little past, but we got a couple more things to talk about, and we'll talk about this part quickly. In Hagehi, we see the prophecy of the end time things happening in the church. In chapter one, it talked about how they wouldn't build the house, they were lazy. They said it wasn't time to build the house of the Lord, and they were going nowhere, no blessing, no nothing and they had curses upon them left and right. And they finally come to the place of God telling them, it is the time to build the house of the Lord, get with the program, essentially. So they start building this. We go back a couple, he stirred them up, and all the remnant, and they came and did work in the house of the Lord. You're gonna build the spiritual house in your life, or you're gonna be left behind in what God wants. So they come to build this house, and the seventh month, now we pay attention. This is the fulfillment of this house being built. In the one and twentieth day of the month, what's that? The last day of tabernacles. This means right at the very end of the time this church is, the church is going to have this thing happen in them in the seventh month, the fulfillment of it. The word of the Lord comes. He's speaking to all the residue, means the remnant. The remnant, those are the ones who are listening. Who's left among you that saw this house in her first glory? How do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it's nothing? What was the first glory? It was in the house that was the house in the book of Acts at the very beginning. The glory of God was tremendous. Tremendous things were happening. Multitudes were getting saved, people healed, being delivered, and set free. Be strong. So you've got to get strong. If you're going to get weak, you're not going to make it. You've got to get strong, and God's the one that strengthens you through the word, all ye people of land. And work means be a doer. It's not the word, word work, it's the word I saw, which means to do. Be doing, meaning you're going to be doing the word, which is doing the work. I am with you, he says. Fear not, can't be afraid of all the things that are going on in the earth, because simultaneously the judgments are going to be poured out. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it's a little while, I will shake the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the dry land. There is a shaking coming like we have never seen or we can't even fathom what it's going to be like. A tremendous shaking is going to happen. I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations, which is Jesus, shall come. He's going to come to all of them so that they have a chance to get right. Remember, the nations that reject him will be turned into hell. They better receive him. And I will fill this house with glory. This is the end time house, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver's mine, the gold's mine, the finances will be for those who are the remnant. They're going to have their finances because God will bring them into their hands as they obey him and follow him and do what he says, of course. Of course, they'll be tithers and givers of offerings. The glory of the latter house, the end time church, shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace. There will be a greater glory upon the end time church. It will be powerful. It will be mighty. There will be a tremendous outpouring. The church is going to come to perfection. The church will be a glorious church. At the same time, the world is going to be getting worse and worse. Isaiah 60. Look what it says. Arise, shine, for the light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. This is speaking the end time church that has met the conditions. Holy, 
righteous, walking in the ways of the Lord, walking uprightly so the glory of God manifests, walking is one. Behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. The darkness is getting darker out there. The wax, evil men are waxing worse and worse. And you think, you've, we keep, keep thinking, boy, is it going to get worse? Yeah, it's going to get worse. Every year it seems to get worse and worse, doesn't it? And it's going to get worse and worse. The gross darkness, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and the glory shall be seen upon thee. God is coming into the end time church. The Gentiles will come to thy light, the kings to the brightness of thy rising. The glorious church is going to see people be brought to the Lord. God is going to move mightily in the end time church to bring a tremendous harvest of souls. The fish are going to be brought in. There'll be tremendous healing and deliverance and God will accomplish great things. Leading up to the end when the church will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, fulfillment of first feast of trumpets, the marriage supper of the Lamb will occur for 10 days in heaven, and then we will be coming back with Him. And we come back with Him, that will be the time of the fulfillment of the Day of Atonement, judgment. After the catching up of the church, Revelation 19, 7, let us be glad and rejoice, give honor to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His wife has made herself ready you got to make yourself ready if you're going to be a part of the marriage. How did the wife get ready? To her it was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. Ah, oh, that's righteousness. It says clean and white. That means you have cleansed yourself. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And what's going to happen? They've come to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then what happens? Now, after that's over, the judgment's going to come. The one who's faithful and true and righteous does judge and make war. This is the Lord coming to bring the judgment upon the nations. And who comes with him? The armies that were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Who's that? That's the marriage partner, which is the bride, which is the church. We are now coming back with him, white and clean and righteous. And what's going to happen? This is the seventh month, tenth day, vengeance of our God upon the nations. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, with it he should smite the nations, shall rule over them with a rod of iron, and tread the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. All those that have rejected him at the end of the 6,000 years, and the time is he's going to take back control of the earth. The judgments are going to come. He's opening up the seals. He's the one who is, has the right of redemption, the right of inheritance for the title deed to the earth. And when those seals are opened up, it's the judgments are going to come upon all those ones who have rebelled against God. And that's going to happen. And at the end of the last seventh trump, that's when we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And after this, we'll come the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. We see what's going to happen, what's the progression going to happen after this judgment that comes on the nations. The key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. The angel's going to come down and take the devil and Satan and bind him for a thousand years. He is going to be laid in the bottomless pit for a thousand years during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ until he would be a thousand years is fulfilled, then he'll be let out for a little season to deceive the, the nations who unfortunately will listen to them amazingly. What's going to happen in the fulfillment of Feast of Trumpets? The rapture, the catching up of the church. What is that? That's the first resurrection. How can you say that the rapture is the first resurrection? Because 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 tells you it is. 16 and 17. The Lord himself shall descend from, with heaven for the shout, from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Who are the dead in Christ? All the ones who have died in the past. What's, what are they going to get? Their glorified bodies. This is the first resurrection, isn't it? And we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds. That means this happens at the same time. We're caught up to meet to him together with them together with the clouds. That's the rapture of the church. And so what all is this? This is the first resurrection. 
Revelation 20, verse 5. This is the first resurrection. Who gets resurrected? The dead in Christ get their bodies first. Who gets their new bodies next? You and I do. Glorified bodies. We get brand new. We're changed. Twinkling them in an eye. Corruption puts on incorruption. Mortality puts on immortality. We get a brand new body. The rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished. All the ones that got wiped out in the judgment, they're going to stay dead in hell for a thousand years. And they will stay there. Who's in this company? And when does this occur? It's at the end of the tribulation, in case you haven't known. The reason why it's so, because who's in this company? Revelation 20, verse 4 tells you, I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given to them, and I saw all the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast. Has the beast come on the scene yet? No. When has he come on the scene? During the tribulation. Neither his image, neither received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. Is that come yet? No. When's it come? During the tribulation. So the people that it's speaking of here are the ones that have come through the tribulation. So this is at the end of the tribulation, right? And what's it say about them? They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Well, that's the church that's been caught up to meet the Lord in the air. This is the first resurrection at the end of the tribulation when the judgments come. Blessed and holy is he hath part in, hath part in the first resurrection, which we will, on such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with them a thousand years. Where are we going to reign? On earth, with Him. That's why you're training for reigning now. You are to learn your authority. You are to work out your own salvation. You are to get cleansed of everything that is not of God. You're to cast out all those devils and get rid of all the filthiness of the flesh and deal with every sin area in your life. You can't be some lazy, lukewarm, half-baked, half, half with God and half not Christian. It's not going to work. You're going to be in the fallaway crowd and or you might be in the martyr crowd. But you won't be in the crowd that's going to be getting through to the end, that's for sure. You and I are to reign with him. When the thousand years are expired, Satan will be loosed out of his prison. He'll go out to deceive the nations that are in the forecourt of the earth. The people, almost all the people are dead, but there'll be some that come through, and they'll start to repopulate the earth for a thousand years, and this will be the nations. They'll gather together to battle. It says they'll come against the camp of the saints, but the fire of God from, came down from God out of heaven. The Father is going to send the fire of God down and devour them all, and they're going to be finished. The devil deceived him, was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone. Now he's going into the lake of fire, not before. The beast and the false prophet will go in immediately at the time of the judgment on the seventh day, seventh month, tenth day, day of atonement. They're tormented day and night forever. See, the lake of fire isn't just for a season. It's forever they're going to be tormented. Saw a great white throne, him that sat on it, his face of the earth, the heaven fled away. There was found no place for them. Saw the dead. Small and great, stand before God. The, the books were open. Everybody's going to be judged out of all their works. That's why you want your works to be only what God would approve. Otherwise, you're in trouble because they aren't going away. You're going to be judged according to them. The sea gave up the dead that were in them, but death and hell get delivered up the dead that were in them. They're judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. That's the second death, separation from God forever. If you're not found written in the book of life, you're cast in the fire. Death and hell cast in the lake of fire, the second death, as it says. New heavens and a new earth. This is the final fulfillment of what tabernacles will be. Because the old earth's got to be burned up because it's been contaminated, see? The first heaven and first earth were passed away. There was no more sea. There won't be any more sea. Enjoy the sea now. It won't be in the coming I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Now we're going to be with the Father. The holy city of New Jerusalem will be coming down. I heard a voice, great voice out of heaven. Behold, the tabernacle of God. What's that? That is God coming in the final fulfillment of tabernacles where the Father is going to dwell with us. With men, he'll dwell with them and be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. What a tremendous thing that God's going to accomplish. 
He will accomplish this. Everything you see about the seventh month is all what's going to happen in the very end before the, the time is concluded, before Jesus accomplishes this great and final work. What's going to happen? The church is going to grow up. The Jubilee has already come. God wants everybody to be liberated. The first fulfillment of it is, the final fulfillment is the judgment on the nations. Every one of us are to come to the place of being holy, righteous. The glory of God is to be manifested in us. We're to be sanctified. We're to be those that are one with Him. We're the ones that, we're the ones that are going to come out of all captivity. We're the ones that are going to come to, to grow up in the things of the Word of God and hear the Word and get it, get it explained clearly to us and understand the true teaching. And the work of God is going to be set, the foundation laid. You're going to grow up. You're going to be the house of God, the glorious church. And you're going to see the rivers of water coming out of you as they fill you. And you're going to be used of the Lord to minister to people all over to see them get born again, healed, delivered, set free. You are going to be a part of that remnant that is going to do the mighty works of the Lord. That is what is going to happen. That is the fulfillment of the seventh month. The prophets that are false are going to get killed. They're going to be dead. The ones that are get joined with a Babylonian group, they're going to get wiped out too. They're going to get killed by the evil nations. They're going to wipe you because you know, have no protection. You've got to come out of her. You'll be, get with their plagues. You'll be judged just like the rest of the nations if you have anything to do with Babylon and the sins of this world. You're going to have to walk a holy walk. And God will do this entire work in you. The job is put him first place, obey him in everything, walk in all of his ways, and watch God do this great and wonderful work in your life. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the revelation of the seventh month. The prophetic revelation reveals the work of God accomplished in the church to be accomplished in me to bring me to the place of being the holy, glorious, one accord, remnant, mighty, righteous church that will have living waters flowing out to accomplish the mighty works of the Lord to bring forth a great harvest in these last days. I thank you, Lord. I will work out my own salvation. I will be a doer of the word. I will be holy and righteous before you. I will be a part of the remnant. I will see the great glory upon me as a part of the end time church. Thank you for accomplishing this great work in my life. Because I put the word of God first place in all that I do. And I cleanse myself from everything that is not of you. Thank you, Lord. I will go on to perfection and be a part of this great glorious church in these last days. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. I trust this has helped you to understand what is happening, what is going to happen, and what you need to be doing to see you be a part of this glorious church. Father, we thank you for all you brought forth. We will be hearers and doers of this word and see this great work accomplished in the fulfillment of your work in us, evidenced by the, what the seventh month tells us is going to happen. Thank you, Father, for all that you brought forth. In Jesus' name, amen.